Good morning. It's good to see you all here today. This is kind of like the uh, postpartum experience from the resurrection. This is the Sunday after the Easter season. And we're going to get right back into the book of Luke, and we're going to pick it up in chapter 20, so that if you guys have your Bibles, you can uh, open to it. If not, the scriptures will be up on the screen so that you can see it. If you remember, before we went into the Good Friday and the resurrection um, remembrance, we were in the book of Luke, and we saw Jesus enter into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the exact day that was prophesied that he would by Daniel. And he comes in and was accepted with all of the fanfare that a Super Bowl winner might if they were going into New York City, if that ever happens again. <laughs> and as Jesus comes in, the Pharisees are trying to shoot him down and say, listen, these people are worshiping you like you're the Messiah. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> because he was. And he said, if these don't cry out, then the rocks will. Because it was such a momentous day. And if you remember, everybody was singing, and they're singing Psalm 118, which is one of the songs of ascent. And it, there's all of this going on. And as this is happening, Jesus begins to weep. Because he looks at all of this fanfare. He knows in a week they're going to forget all about this, and they're going to be crying out, crucify him. And he wept for Jerusalem. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the ones that the prophets had gone to. How often I've wanted to take you as a mother hen takes her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling. And he said, oh, that you would know this, the day of your visitation. And Jesus wept because he knew that the city would then be destroyed at a later date. In the midst of all of this rejoicing and excitement, Jesus is coming in on a small little animal, probably dragging his feet looking somewhat ridiculous for a full-grown man on a small animal and being proclaimed as the king as he weeps and everyone else cheers. And so all of that has happened, and, and we know the end of the story because we've gone through the, the celebration of the resurrection. But this week that's being covered here in the book of Luke in chapter 20 and following is the week when Jesus is in Jerusalem, and it's the week between Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday, and Good Friday, obviously. So this is the week where he's in the temple courts. And if you remember, we left him when he came in, he goes right to the temple, and he found them practicing all sorts of crazy things that they weren't supposed to be doing in the temple courts, and they were making business, and they were ripping people off and charging way too much. You know, you think we have troubles with inflation. You're right, they had trouble with inflation. And it was the chief priests who were behind all of that, making tons of money on the side uh, off money exchanges and off selling animals that were way higher priced than they should have been. And they were using this day, this whole religious system was being used not to glorify God, but to make people rich for their greed. And Jesus went in and turned over the tables of the money changers and he let out the animals and he let them go and he braided a cord, and he made it into a whip, and he began to whip the animals out of the temple. And he said, this is the house of God. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. You've turned it into a den of thieves. And he clears the temple, and everybody leaves, except for the ones who were there to pray. And he restores this thing. All of this happens on the day that Jesus comes into Jerusalem, it's the day that you would come and the next four days, you would bring your animal and you would take it to the priests and they would examine it and look over every inch of it and make sure it was perfect for the Passover, for the sacrifice. And if it wasn't, you had to get one that was acceptable. If it was acceptable, you, you had four days to get this thing done. And within these next four days, Jesus, the very Lamb of God, is going to be inspected as he's in the city of Jerusalem. And so as you look at it, it's going to seem almost like a court appearance where Jesus goes in and it's conflict after conflict. It's because they're trying to find fault with him. And 
you guys know the end of the story. They found no fault with him. In Luke chapter 20, verse 2 says this, tell us by what authority you are doing these things or who is it who gave you this authority? They're questioning Jesus on the authority of who told you you could come in here and take over. These are the religious elite and it's always been the religious elite who have stood in the way of many things that God wants to do. Much to my shame as we sit here in a church this morning. It's the established church or the established religion that very often stands opposed to the things that God tries to do because, you know, we're trying to protect our phony baloney jobs sort of mentality. And that's what they're going up against Jesus with. So as we look at this, the inspection of the lamb for sacrifice, we're going to pick it up and, and go through the very first section of it. So we're looking at Jesus coming in on Palm Sunday. He clears the temple. He's crucified. He's dead and he's buried. And then on the third day, he rises and he meets with his disciples and lets them know what he's planning on doing. We're going to go through the first 19 verses. We're going to see a problem that's presented to Jesus. There's a parable that Jesus tells in response. And then there's a prophecy that he gives. So just those three things, um, trying to be a good theologian and have three points because four would be way too many. <laughs> Verse one, now it happened on one of those days as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel that the chief priests and the scribes together with the elders confronted him and spoke to him saying, tell us by what authority are you doing these things? Or who is it who gave you this authority? But he answered and said to them, I also will ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. And so they answered that they did not know where it was from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So Jesus is confronted by these folks as he's teaching in the temple courts and he's doing this for the week of Passover and he's preaching the gospel, which is the good news. But this is on the tail end of him cleaning out the temple courts and now he's there teaching. So now he's cleared the classroom of all the riffraff and now he's going to teach. And in one of those days, he begins by teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel. The gospel is a very well-used word and, and sometimes we don't understand what it is. We think gospel music is, you know, Southern music and the gospel is the good news. The good news starts with the bad news. We're all rotten to the core, amen? amen. And we need a savior. Because in and of ourselves, we would lead to utter destruction of our lives and everyone around us. The Bible teaches us that we have a disease of which we will die. It's called sin. And we're infected with it. And all of our thoughts and all of the intention of our hearts and all the activity of our hands and everywhere we go and all the people we meet, it oozes out of us and makes everything corrupt. Like something left in the fridge way too long. And that's the way we are in nature. Now, God didn't create us this way. We went that way because we decided to step off of God's plan. And sin then entered humankind, and we now genetically hand it off to our ancestors. You will notice children are the most selfish human beings on the face of the planet. As delicious as they may be, it's all about them. And you have to orbit them. And then you have to teach them to be self-sacrificing and to be moral. You can't steal another child's binky. You just don't do that. But children don't know that. I want it. I'm getting it. And we are sinners from birth. That's why God makes them so little so they don't take over. <laughs> the gospel begins with the bad news that we are sinners. Every single one of us. No, we're not good people. We are rotten people. We are sinners. And anybody says, oh, well, you're a good boy. You know, I get the tap on the face. 
You had a good boy. I'm not a good boy. I'm a rotten boy. Without Jesus, you wouldn't want to know me. You wouldn't want to be with me. And so the problem is that we're sinners and we need a Savior. And Jesus is proclaiming, hey, it's me and I'm here. That's the gospel. The good news is that Jesus came to take our sins away by taking it upon his own body. He was the perfect sacrifice lamb who was being inspected this week. And so the Pharisees come and begin to poke and prod at him. They're going to ask him lots of questions. Next week, they're going to ask about Caesar and paying taxes. They're going to ask about Moses and obeying the law. They're going to talk about David. Actually, Jesus proposes a question to them. But to this week, they're asking him flat out, tell us, who, who do you think you are? Coming in here and straightening everything out and kicking everyone out, who do you think you are? Who gave you authority to do this? Now, the, you'll notice the ones that are coming to him are the ones that have authority. It's the chief priests. Notice it's plural, but there's only supposed to be one. Rome got involved and messed that up. The scribes. These are the ones who would take the word of God and write it down word for word. And if they made a mistake, that's it. You've got to make a new copy. They would make a new copy. These guys had a, giant chunks of the scriptures memorized. And so they were going to analyze Jesus and see if what he says is going to match with what the scripture says. And then the elders. These are the ones that were the heads of families that were there for a long time. They're the ones who had some wisdom. Actually, there are two words for elders. One means to be an overseer and one means to have gray hair. The word presbyteros actually means gray-haired one. So uh, it's those with gray hair, it's those, and they earned it, presumably. So you've got these three groups of people who are now having an intervention with Jesus, and in the middle of his teaching, they come up and they corner him, and they say, by whose authority? Who do you think you are? Who told you to do this? And Jesus is being challenged by them. And you would think, oh my goodness, it, he, he might shrink and, and die. He might be intimidated. No, not at all. And they confronted him publicly. By the way, if you ever need to confront somebody about something they're doing wrong, do it privately. Because if you don't do it privately and you're wrong, you will be incredibly embarrassed like these guys are. But if something has been done publicly, it needs to be announced publicly. If, if I teach something that's inerrant in the word of God, I need to give you a public apology or somebody else needs to tell you that I'm way off base. Publicly. That's why not many people should be assumed to be teachers because you'd be judged more strictly. What authority or whose authority? They're asking, who do you think you are? You come here and start changing everything. I want you to know that confidence is not authority. There are lots of classes that will teach you to have confidence. Public speaking classes that will teach you to take your voice <laughs> and to assume interesting and like you're a professor or perhaps you need to be on radio. <laughs> confidence is not authority. Although sometimes we perceive confidence as authority and it's not. There are lots of classes that teach you about how to have confidence, self-confidence, especially public speaking. Just imagine everyone in their underwear. I mean, there's a million silly things that people will tell you so that you can gain confidence, but that gives you no authority. Authority comes from God alone and the systems in which he's created. That's the only place that authority comes from. You don't manufacture it on your own, although some people think so. A study on authority, you can look at the Roman centurion that comes to Jesus back in, in uh, Luke. He comes to him and he says, listen, my servant is sick and ill in bed and I, I need you to uh, heal him. And Jesus says, okay, let's go. And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. But, he says, I am a man also under authority. I also am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, and I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. I want you to notice, he doesn't say, listen, I understand authority. I got people under me. You would think that would be the natural thing, but he doesn't say that. He says, Jesus, I know who you are, and I know what authority is like, because I am a man also under authority. 
You see, he realized if you don't, if you're not under authority, you have no authority. The only authority you have is because you're under authority. Isn't that interesting? I remember the first time I saw that, I was like, I never saw that. Because it was the first time I saw it. You don't have authority unless authority has been given to you. You don't take it. You don't manufacture it. You don't assume it. And just because somebody's confident doesn't mean they have authority. So be careful because you can get on the internet and everybody claims to know something. And by golly, it's got to be true if it got on the internet. <laughs> or Twitter would have taken it the heck off of there, right? <laughs> be careful what you listen to and accept as authoritative. If it's not based on the word of God, you need to look through it because there may be some bones in that fish. And you only want to eat the meat and you don't want to swallow the bones, right? So that's a nice little thing on authority and confidence is not authority. Righteous authority is always given. It is never taken. And so we understand this. And it's a funny thing because Jesus marveled at what this man said. And he goes, I haven't found such a faith in all of Israel. And he goes, may it be to you according to your faith. And his servant was healed just like that without Jesus having to show up or anything. He made it happen long distance. And this is a centurion, okay? This is a guy who's over a hundred men. They're pretty tough guys. And he humbles himself to come to a Jewish rabbi. And he shows faith in who he is in the person of Jesus. And Jesus grants him that by his faith. It's a good take on what authority is. And he knew that Jesus was under authority. Because all throughout the scriptures, he says, I do nothing on my own. I only do what I see the Father do. I do what the Father tells me to do. And Jesus' whole life was that way in submission to the will of the Father. You remember in the garden, he says, Lord, that this cup could pass from me. That I won't have to drink it, but... Not my will, but thy will be done. You see, Jesus showed that he was under authority. That's what gave him authority. And it's the same thing for us. Amen. But he answered to them and he said to them, I will also ask you one thing and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? They said, listen, we want to know, you know, who you think you are and who, you, who sent you. And he goes, okay, well, I got a question for you. You answer my question, I'll answer your question. And so Jesus asks him about John the Baptist and his baptism. Does that seem a little left field to you? Oh, you want to know what authority I have? Hey, what about John the Baptist? What do you think about his baptism? Hey, what do you think about the Mets? You think they got a chance? It just seems like totally off the wall, doesn't it? But it's not. It's important because what they have to say about John has a lot to do with what they're asking him. Because the funny thing is they didn't recognize John's authority either, did they? And they questioned him. But I love that Jesus answers the question with a question. Don't you think that's a good idea? There is such depth when someone asks a question you don't, you don't see the rest of the iceberg underneath. You, you only hear what they're saying. But that tells you a lot about their heart, doesn't it? These guys, all of the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders had authority. In, in the whole chain of command, they had authority. And they were the ones running the whole bazaar, making all this money. And they say, who do you think you are? What kind of authority do you have? He says, well, let me ask you a question. What about John the Baptist? What do you think about his baptism? You think that was a man-made thing? You think it was just a fad like bell-bottoms just kind of came in and went out? Or do you think that this was of God? And so now they've got a problem. There's sometimes more to be learned from the question asked than for the answer that's given. You ever have somebody come up to you and ask you a question and you're not sure how to answer it? that might be that you need more information before you answer it. I've had husband and wives walk up to me and say, Pastor Dave, and they ask me a riddle. And I can see four eyes staring at me, looking for an answer, and I'm like, this is a trap. A woman will come to me, should a wife submit to her husband in every occasion? I don't know, does a husband have to love his wife like Christ loved the church and lay his life down for her all the time? 
you see, you can answer a question with a question, and it's very helpful to exhume what the real motive is in asking the question. And sometimes you need a little bit more information before you answer. So John's baptism, why does Jesus select that? John's baptism, and we're told this if you go to chapter 19 in the book of Acts, that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. There were those who would come and say, listen, I've been living a rotten life and I want to start new. And John says, no problem. This, is the, this, this cleansing right here, this ceremonial observance is done in prayer and it's you an opportunity to testify what a bum you've been and how you need to change. It's a baptism of repentance. He's the guy who started all this. The priests used to do it, but only the priests. It wasn't a public thing. John the Baptist started a new thing. And Jesus said, well, is this new thing of Christ? Is this of God or is this of man? The question is, what is it? Well, we observe it here in this church and actually we've taken special tests, uh, special measures to make sure that we can actually have baptisms even in the colder weather before the water gets warm. Brother, Carl has gone out and bought us a pool. And we're going to set up that pool in the backyard. It's not that big. It's a blow up. We all can't go in. But <laughs> we, we have some folks here who have not entered into baptism and proclaiming their faith in <laughs> baptism. And it's going to be an opportunity. But the baptism of John was different from the baptism of Jesus. The baptism of John was just unto repentance. The baptism of Jesus, when you go down into the water, you're associating with his death. And when you come up out of the water, you're identifying with his resurrection. But Jesus thought it was an important thing, and obviously he thought it was from heaven. And so he submits himself to this baptism of repentance, which Jesus didn't have anything to repent of. John the Baptist said the very same thing. And if you remember, when Jesus went down in the water and John put him down, the Spirit of God came and fell upon him, and then there was a voice from heaven that said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. You have the voice of the Father from heaven, you have Jesus himself, and you have the Holy Spirit coming down upon Jesus and filling him and empowering for his ministry. That is the baptism of Jesus, and we have the very similar baptism that Jesus has. It's a commitment, a full commitment to do what God would have us do. So his question to them is, what about John's baptism? If you remember, the Pharisees came while he was doing that, and he saw them up on a hill, and he says, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You brood of vipers. Like, hi, how are you? Welcome to the baptism. These guys were looking down on everyone. They were, they were judging John, and they didn't think that his ministry, they wanted to know if he was the Messiah, because they knew it's pretty close to the time the Messiah is supposed to show up. And he said, listen, I'm not that guy. That guy, I couldn't even bend down to, to take his shoe off. I'm not even worthy to do that. And so John the Baptist, repentance, Jesus Christ, it's about a full commitment to do the will of God. So it's a changed thing. But he asked them, do you think this is of man or if it's of God? In John 10, 23 to 29, we see why Jesus answers with a question. And Jesus walked into the temple in Solomon's porch and the Jews surrounded him and said to him, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, but you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name, they bear witness of me, but you do not believe because you're not my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Jesus said, no matter how I answer this question, you've already made your mind up. So why would I answer your question? Because you're looking for a reason to take me. You're looking for a reason to hang me up on a cross. And that's the only answer you want. You don't want truth. You're not asking a question because you really want the truth. You're asking a question because you want to corner me, because it's a trap. You know what it's like when somebody's trying to trap you? Sometimes you don't notice it. Sometimes you do. Sometimes you figure, oh, well, let me see. Let me wade into the waters a little here. 
not a good idea because it's a trap. And they reasoned among themselves saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, well, then why did you not believe him? That's a good point. But if we say that this baptism is from men, all the people will stone us for they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it was from. And Jesus said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Interesting. It's like a little game of ping pong. And he hits it back at him. I love that. That's called wisdom. But Jesus is out playing them. Notice what they say. If we say. You see, they're not, they don't care about truth. The truth was not their concern. It's about how they were perceived. Do you realize that in today's society, that's like hugely important? Well, how do I look? You know, what do people think of me? Uh, do they think I'm nice? <laughs> why is that so important? Why, why don't you just stand for what's true? And standing for truth is not something that's very common today. You'll find some people that have the bravery to stand up and say, listen, this is what I believe in. You know, their confidence doesn't necessarily mean they have authority. But I'll tell you, it means something, doesn't it? It's certainly better than I don't know. These guys just copped out and got, you know, weak and said, I don't know. When you have to take a poll before you make up your mind, you have none. As a politician, if, you're, if they say, what, what's your stand on this? And it, Wait a minute, we have to take a poll of the people and see what they say. What do you people say? Oh, you people say, oh, okay, that's what I think. I think what they think. Politicians do that all the time. They take a poll and see what the people say. You know, what do you think? I, I, think, we should, I think we should bomb Texas. Well, let's take a poll. Most people think we should do it. I think we better get on it. We better talk to Congress. And What? That's the sort of relativ relativistic morality that this world has. There's no such thing as truth because they have no basis of truth because they've thrown it away. They've taken the scriptures and delegated it to some kind of a, an ancient text that you can't rely upon because it was written by man and none of it makes sense and it doesn't hold together. They've never read it. So don't take a poll before you make up your mind. There's this inspiration and perspiration aspect. He's asking, is the baptism of John of God, is it inspired or is it of man? In other words, invented by somebody's effort and somebody's work. The question is, it was sent by God and it, it had a basic kind of a change as it went through in who Jesus came and it was to announce and prepare his way. Then when Jesus came, it went to announce that we are his and fully his. So those of you who are not baptized, um, make sure you contact me after the service and We'll figure out a way to get that pool filled and we're going to put hot water in it to warm it up because Pastor Dave doesn't like cold water. It has nothing to do with your comfort. <laughs> there's an aspect in which there's this wonderful thing where God uses our perspiration in his inspiration. And you can't divorce one from the other. Jesus said that we should pray earnestly. We're told in the book of James that the, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That when you pray, God will change, but he never changes his mind, but he does inspire us to pray. And yet he works through that. If I were to stand up here and just depend upon my ability to remember scriptures and, and remember addresses, forget that, I'd forget that, um, or remember your names, by golly. Uh, I, I'm having trouble with all those categories. I have to put some work into it. I, th this took some work, putting this up here. I believe God has called me, he's ordained me to do certain things, and he's especially gifted me to talk to a bunch of knuckleheads. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's my qualification. <laughs> but they're coming up to Jesus saying, what are your qualifications? Where did you go, you know? Did you go to yeshiva? Where did, you know, who's, who's your rabbi? Who do you follow? Who's discipling you? Um, you know, where did you, where'd you get your doctor's degree? What did you do your thesis on? Jesus didn't have any of that. You know what the amazing thing is? Charles Spurgeon. 
He started preaching when he was 15 years old. You know, he had one year of official schooling. He didn't go to Bible college. He didn't go to seminary. He didn't have to write a doctor thesis. And he's called the king of preachers. If you ever read his stuff, it's an amazing thing that at 15 years old, he was done learning in formal learning settings. But God gifted him and ordained him to do what he did. And he was a fantastic man. But because there was inspiration by God and he was called to do such thing and there was perspiration, there was that element of which we have to add work and be obedient and do those things that God tells us to do, that God works through all of those things. God will work through you as well. And I guarantee you, every single one of you who knows the Lord Jesus Christ is gifted in some way to do something. The question is what? You can't just sit back and depend upon God leading you and gifting you to do all of that, you need to step out in faith and do something about it. Amen? Amen. Which means you can't just sit back and be a spectator. By the way, the church is not a spectator sport. Amen. Amen. Their past failure to hear the truth about John disqualified them from hearing more truth from Jesus. That's a little scary. I have had times when I felt like God was far away and he wasn't speaking to me and he wasn't as close to me as he used to be. And I think, was there some essential truth or something that he spoke to me that I disregarded? That I wasn't obedient to? That I just put to the side much like the Pharisees did? I wonder if they heard the voice from heaven as Jesus was baptized, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I wonder if they heard that. I wonder if some of them may have been in this group. I wonder if the apostle Paul was in this group. He was one of them. Before he became Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus. These are things I wonder. These questions I'll ask when I get there. But I see their past failure to hear the truth about John disqualified them, and so Jesus tested them. Hey, what do you think about John? What do you think about his ministry? Uh, we don't know. Okay, well, I won't tell you either because it won't do any good because you've already made up your mind. So, are you walking in the light you've been given? Has God shown something to you personally, each one of you individually, something that you're not stepping out on? It's one of those things that will prohibit God giving you something else. And so I would encourage you, be careful, because I've talked to people who have gone off-road and they end up far from Christ. And I say, when was the last time God spoke to you? What was the why in the road? And it's usually an event of which they decided, nah, I don't think so, Lord. I mean, I love you with all my heart, kind of, but... Nah, and they just say no. And I could give you story after story, sad stories of people that got to the point in their walk with God when they just said, no, that's enough. I've, I've given you, you know, enough of myself. And because of that, he no longer will reveal truths from then on because you've already disregarded that which you've been given. And that which you've been given will be taken away. So this is what I see. Jesus is now going to go into a parable after presenting a problem. Then he began to tell the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard. He leased it to vine dressers and he went into a far country for a long time. And now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the wine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent another servant, and they beat him also, treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him also and cast him out. And then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him if they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. And so they cast him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? 
he will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And they knew that he had spoken this parable against them. When they heard it, they said, certainly not. And then he looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but whoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. And the chief priests and the scribes at that very hour sought to lay hands on him, but they feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken this parable against them. It's interesting. Jesus spoke to them and they got it, but they didn't do anything about it because they had already made up their mind. So Jesus begins in his usual storytelling way, and he says, there, there was a certain man who planted a vineyard, and he leased it out to vine dressers, and he went to a far country for a long time. And now at vintage time, he sent a servant to the wine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him, and they sent him away empty-handed. You see, Jesus is telling the history of the Jewish people. Jesus is talking about people who have come to Jerusalem and tried to share the truth with the people in the religious establishment, and they wouldn't listen. And most of the prophets, if you know anything about them, they suffered violently at the hands of the religious system of the day. We know this because the Bible always verifies itself. There's this wonderful expositional constancy that runs through that God uses certain pictures throughout the scriptures consistently. Isaiah 5 verses 1 to 7 says this, let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard. By the way, the well-beloved is God, has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and he cleared its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and he also made a wine press in it so that he expected it to bring forth good grapes. But it brought forth wild grapes. By the way, wild grapes are really teeny and very sour. And now, O oh inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge please between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than what I have done in it? Why then? I expected it to bring forth good grapes. Did it bring forth wild grapes? And now, please, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned, and break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it to waste. It shall not be pruned or dug, and there shall come up briars and thorns, and I will also command the clouds that no rain would come upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. You see, it defines the vineyard right there very clearly. And the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. God planted a vineyard and set it aside called Jerusalem, called the people of God, called Israel. And he put everything in place so that fruit could be gained. He sent the law, he sent Moses, he sent the prophets. And yet there was no fruit of repentance. There was no fruit as to the very reason that God put it there. There's another one here in Psalm 80. You have brought a vine out of Egypt. Notice the language, you know, Israel came out of Egypt. You have cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared room for it and caused it to take deep root. And it filled the land, and the hills were covered with its shadow. And the mighty cedars brought its boughs. And she sent out her boughs to the sea and her branches to the river. Why have you broken down her hedges so that all who pass by the way pluck her fruit? The boar out of the woods uproots it, and the wild beast of the field devours it. These are the various people groups that have come in, like Babylon, Assyria, Greece, Rome, always occupying, occupying Israel. Why has God allowed this to happen? Return, I, we beseech you, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and see and visit this vine and the vineyard which your right hand has planted and the branch that you made strong for yourself. It is burned with fire, it is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of your countenance. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand. By the way, it's another way of speaking of the Messiah 
upon the Son of Man whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we will not turn back from you. Revive us and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Cause your face to shine and we shall be saved. You see, the Old Testament is just rife with these pictures that the, the vine is Israel. And Jesus is talking about those who are in charge of making fruit and it wasn't happening. So Jesus is talking about a certain man who planted a vineyard, that's God himself, who leased the vineyard to vine dressers. That would be the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders that he's speaking to. And he went to a far country for a long time. He's talking about the time between the last prophet Malachi to speak and Jesus' arrival just after John the Baptist. He went away for a long time. There's these silent years in there. Now, at vintage time, he sent a servant to the vine dressers. They might have some of the fruit in the vineyard, but the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He's talking about the prophets and even John the Baptist, who was rejected. Again, he sent another servant, and they beat him also, treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him also and cast him out. The owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? Imagine God trying to reach down constantly and reach to the people he's spoken to and set in place all of the laws and given revelation to, and they not listen. What does God say? What am I going to do? Think about some of the history, if you, if you understand Hebrews chapter 11, the, the chapter of faith, gives us a little explanation. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted they were slain by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. He was speaking about all of those who have come to the, the people of Israel trying to speak the truth to them and they didn't hear it. They would not listen. They shut up their ears and their heart. Isaiah, one of the, one of the largest prolific books that we have, full of prophecy and full of rebuke to these people, they didn't listen to him. And what they eventually did was they sought him in two for speaking the truth. Jeremiah, according to the early church father Tertullian, the Jews stoned Jeremiah to death in Daphne, which is called Tepahis in Hebrew, in Egypt. Jeremiah's crime was telling them the truth that they did not want to hear. And the tradition of Jeremiah's martyrdom is backed up by another first century extra biblical writings. The lives of the prophets involved in the works of Jerome, Isidore, and Seville's some French thing, and Peter's commensator's 12th century Historia Scholastica. So, yeah, I actually rehearsed that in the office, but I forget how to say it, so. I wanted to sound like I was French, but, you know, I didn't do it. You have these major prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah were huge prophets, and God spoke through them mightily, spoke into the future uh, things that hadn't come yet, like the Messiah's coming, and they sought him in two for it, and they stoned Jeremiah to death for speaking the truth. So when Jesus talks about a vineyard that's been given to these people who are supposed to take care of it, and they haven't, and it hasn't given fruit because they didn't do the work that they should have done. The work they should have done was dedicate themselves to the Lord's work and to be holy, and they didn't do it. They were more interested in political position and power. Now Jesus is going to get out of that prophecy. Oh, he's going to get into the prophecy as he comes out of this speech. I will send my beloved son. Who's Jesus speaking about? Him? Himself. Probably they will respect him when they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, I remember he's speaking to them. They reasoned among themselves exactly what they just did before they gave him an answer of, I don't know saying, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and they killed him. Jesus is prophesying about his death. He's saying, all the prophets that have come before you rejected and you reject me, his very son. And God's saying, gee, I hope somebody listens. But they didn't listen to him. And they figured, well, if the son is coming here, the father must be dead. And if we kill the son, we can take over the property. It's all ours. You see, the chief priests, scribes, and the elders, 
they thought if they killed Jesus, they would still retain power and authority. Not understanding that authority is something that's given and never taken. In Matthew 3, verses 16 and 17, it talks about when Jesus was baptized. And Jesus came up immediately out of the water. And behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We know that Jesus is talking about himself. They should know that Jesus is talking about himself. And we see later on, they said, they realized that he was speaking this against them. And it's said twice in this passage. Jesus is the son in this picture. And he's the one who's gonna be cast out of the vineyard. He wasn't allowed to be killed in Jerusalem. He was outside and he was hung up on a cruel cross for everybody to see. And regardless of all the artwork you see, he was flat out naked. That was part of the punishment. Behold, the king of the Jews. And they had him crucified. This is exactly what's about to happen. And Jesus prophesies and speaks right to them exactly the intention is their heart and exactly what's going on. And Jesus is like that, isn't he? He knows exactly how to speak to our hearts. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. And he knew that he had spoken this parable against them. In 70 AD, within 40 years of Jesus' ministry, Jerusalem is torn down to the ground in 70 AD by Titus Vespasian. And they take all of the gold out of the temple, they kill millions of Jews, and Jerusalem is now sacked and leveled to the ground. No more sacrifices because they're not needed. The Son of God came and gave one sacrifice for our sin. That's good for all of our sin. But it's because they hardened their hearts and they didn't listen to God when he came to speak to them. Be careful because you can lose everything if you don't listen to what the Lord tells you. I, I know that firsthand. You can lose things. And so they have, uh, this is actually on the arch of Titus, uh, Titus Vespasian, and they have this wonderful victory that he won over the Jews, uh, all engraved, and you can see the menorah, very, uh, what, what we call a menorah, but it's actually the, uh, the lights that were in the temple. And they took all of the gold, and they took one stone off of another, off of another, all the way down to the foundation to dig the gold out of it. So according to what Jesus said in Matthew 24, not one stone will be left upon another. It exactly happened, as he said. And Jerusalem was given to another. The religious oversight now of the revelation of God has been given to the church, you and me. We're another people, and because Jesus came, the Jewish Messiah, and we have faith in the Jewish Messiah, we have salvation. We are a new people. We are not the originals. We're the, we're the fill-ins. We're the substitutes. Praise God that there's room for us. But be careful that you don't disregard when God speaks because there's a lot riding on it. And when they heard it, they said, certainly not, no way. And he looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? By the way, it says that he looked at them. It says that he stared at them. He made eye contact with them. And you know what it is when somebody's about to tell you something that's really serious and makes eye contact and says, you better listen, pal. He looked at them and said, what then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but whoever it falls will grind him to powder. And you say, well, what is this stone? There's this, ex this principle of exponential consistency as you go through the scriptures. Jesus has always been the stone. You've seen it in metaphors and in shadows in the Old Testament, and now he's flat out telling it. In Psalm 118, which is, by the way, what they were singing when Jesus came in on Palm Sunday, and the, the, the Pharisee said, you better shut your people down. They're thinking you're the Messiah. And he says, no, they're right. <laughs> Psalm 118, I praise you for you have answered me and you've become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now. That's what they were saying, Hosanna, which means save now. 
Save now, I pray, O Lord, O Lord, I pray. Send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord and he has given us light and there's a sudden change. Bind the sacrifice with cords on the horns of the altar. That means crucify him, crucify him. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. Do you realize that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was not a failure, it was a completion of prophecy. It was the needed sacrifice for you and I or we would not be able to be free to have a relationship with God, be forgiven of our sins and have our shame removed. In fact, in Ephesians 2.20, it says something more of the stone. It says that, that, the, that our life, our Christian life, is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. You'll see it also says that in Corinthians, uh, in Colossians. There are other places in which he's likened unto a stone. In 1 Peter, it says, coming to him as a living stone, Jesus is a living stone, now that's a, that's a rather interesting uh, thing because I've never seen a living stone. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now we're getting a little bit drawn out. It's not just the rock on which everything is built, but it's also a smiting stone, uh, like an ax head. <laughs> they stumble because being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now a people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. You see, we are the people of God that God has called. We are those living stones that are to be built together. And uh, as, as we get built together, we, we will be rubbing up on each other and polishing each other off, I hope. So some of my rough spots you'll polish off and some of your rough spots I'll polish off. And so you see this consistency running through. But this introduces that this stone is not just a stone that's built upon, but it's also one that comes and brings judgment. If you know anything about the book of Daniel in chapter 7, there's this wonderful vision of um, this statue, this vision that Daniel has, uh, that actually Daniel interprets where there's this head of gold and these shoulders and of silver and then there's the bronze abdomen and then there's this, the iron legs that go into feet of clay. What Jesus is doing is he's laying out all the nations of the world in history from top to bottom. Nebuchadnezzar is the head. And then coming down and then obviously the Roman Empire being split in two, in two arms anyway. I don't want to go into the whole prophetic thing. All of the nations of the world, but they're getting worse and worse and worse and lesser in value until there's feet of clay at the bottom. And suddenly there's a stone that comes out of heaven that strikes it and shatters the whole thing to the ground. That stone is Jesus Christ when he comes again. So you see, Jesus is the rock, but he's not just the one to be built upon, but he's also the one that will make you into powder if he lands on you. Make sure you throw yourself upon him broken and you won't be crushed and ground into powder. Does that make sense? Amen. And that's what we do. There are only two choices. Fall upon him and be broken or you will fall, he will fall upon you and crush you. It's called judgment. As we stand before God in the last day when we breathe our last and have to give an account of what we've done in our lives, I... I don't look forward to that in my flesh, but I know that Jesus has come and taken my sin away. So when I stand before him, I will be clean, white, forgiven, 
blessed and I will be accepted, not because of anything I've done, but because of what Jesus did for me and because I just placed my faith in him alone. Amen? Amen? So, if he falls upon you, you'll be powder. But if you come to him, you have to be broken. There's a sense in which you can't have an agenda of your own. You can't add Jesus as an ingredient to your life. He needs to be everything. And when that happens, God comes into our lives and makes us new. Amen? Amen. How many of you have experienced this new birth? Amen. So you know it's true. And stones landing on you aren't always a good thing. This, this poor fellow is in Pompeii. He's got a giant stone over his carcass. That is, that is the future for those who don't accept the gift that God offers. The stone will fall upon them and they'll be ground to powder. And as graphic as that is, uh, that's what Jesus said. And the chief priests and the scribes in that very hour sought to lay hands on him, not in a nice way, but they feared the people for they knew that he had spoken this parable against them. So they said, you know, we can't shut this guy down. We can't confound him. We can't catch him in his words. So we're going to have to kill him. We're going to have to do it. And if you watch progressively through the story of the New Testament, you see John the Baptist, they approved of him being imprisoned and had his head cut off. If you see a little bit later with Jesus, they facilitated, forced his death upon somebody who said, listen, I don't find anything wrong with him. They said, well, he claims to be a king. If he's a king, then you're no friend of Caesar if you let him get away. And he goes, I'll be right back. And he talks to Jesus. He says, is it true that you're a king? He says, yeah, you said it. I'm a king. You're right. But if this isn't my kingdom though. If so, then my, my followers would fight. He goes out and he says, listen, I found nothing wrong with him, but I'm supposed to release somebody. So here's this really dirty, rotten, terrible murderer. And here's your king. Which one would you like released? And they chose the murderer. And so they shut him down. And then we see with Stephen, the stoning of Stevens, they were actually the ones who put him to death by stoning. It's like here they approved of it. Here they consorted to make it happen, and now they are the ones who actually picked up the stones to stone Stephen. And that is, that is the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit right there. That is the final, the final straw. And so the stone will fall upon them in judgment. So as Jesus is tested in this week, as we look at him, he is the Lamb of God, and you're going to see all of this poking and prodding and questions and all the behind the scenes trying to trap him and they won't be able to do it because he is Jesus after all, who's my hero. I want to be just like him. I want to speak like him. I want to walk like him. I want to have a heart like him because he was the lamb of God who gave his life for me. And so I want to give my life to him. As the worship team comes up, I want you guys to consider what the Lord would have you do with this message. Because we can come here and, you know, punch our card and warm a seat and, and spend time and say, well, you know, I, I did my duty. I'm out of here. But I'd be willing to bet that the Lord has spoken to many of you here today about something that the Lord would have you do. We have a responsibility. We're walking in light to accept that. Because I don't want it to be where I don't have a rich, deep relationship where the Lord is constantly speaking to me and taking me and directing me. I want to live that life. I don't want to just go so far and say, well, this is enough. You know, I got enough. Enough of Jesus in my life. Because you could become cold-hearted and I don't, want, I don't want any of our hearts to get that way. Thank you. Thank you.